I forgot they blow it up. So that means in Ken 10, they rebuilt it. I'm like four minutes into this episode and I can't stop looking at everything. It's like, God, it looks so cool. How can you not appreciate this? Look, I don't even smile when I terrorize Gwen anymore. You're even worse than I thought. Why is that a bad thing? Oh, wow, you don't get any enjoyment out of pissing off your cousin? And now we finally see future Ben. What's up guys, Kuro the Artist here and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. Today we'll be taking a look at the first time travel episode of the franchise where Ben and Gwen are thrown into the future and meet future versions of themselves, Grandpa Max, and some future villains. This episode also introduces the first Ben 10,000 which as many people can recall was kind of a jerk. Or was he? During my breakdown, I found myself more and more questioning and even defending Ben 10,000's actions and comparing it to how other people see him. By the end of this video, I hope to open your eyes up to what I see and how the original Ben 10,000 might be pretty different than what you remember. If this is your first breakdown and you're wondering how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below along with a playlist to all of my previous breakdowns, but by all means, stick around and watch this one first. I'm sure you'll like this video anyways. Before we begin, Let's take a quick look at last week's poll. With two seasons of breakdowns now completed, I asked you guys which one was your favorite. As with many of these polls, there was a winner by a landslide, this one being season two. I agree with these results, but this isn't to knock season one for what it is. Season one is fantastic, and while I do like that it has a story arc unlike season two, the second season was just better in my opinion. And as it shows, 82% of you guys agree. Our season three premiere, Ben 10,000, first premiered November 25th, 2006, written by Greg Wiseman. Greg Wiseman is most known for creating the shows The Spectacular Spider-Man, Gargoyles, and my personal favorite, Young Justice. Future Gwen brings the two adolescent Tennysons into the future with a looming crisis that Ben 10,000 himself can't handle alone. And with the return of Dr. Animo teaming up with a newly upgraded Vilgax, it seems like she might be right. Let's take a look. I don't think I've noticed this before, but you can see Mount Rushmore in the background. Also, check out that height difference. Sometimes they draw Gwen significantly taller than Ben, and other times they're the same size. See, in this shot, she's not that much taller than him. When do I have time to go get some dumb old cake? He's kind of got a point. Like, I was more of thinking he's like 10 years old with no job. How is he going to get a cake, period? But at the same time, Ben, you're not like busy 24-7. You absolutely had enough time. Fine. Play you to see who goes. One, two... Future Gwen's portals looking like a charm of Bazelle is a beautiful touch. The background starts warping behind it too. Lots going on here. This is a pretty epic shot. They even animated the roof tarp flapping in Ben and Gwen. The ground is dirt. Now the ground is grass. And as the dial pops up, you can still see the dial in place before it fully extends. Not to just start ripping apart the episode, but this is another one that I've seen so many times that all the smaller details stick out to me much more clearly. And you can sort of tell Cannon Bolt was a recent addition just because he looks so much more cleaner and better animated than all the others. He's got quite the amount of detail and fluidity to his animation. Then you get ones like Stinkfly. It's like a little bit of a jump in quality. I really like this flash effect they add for when the portal forms. It's pretty simple. You gotta glow up the contrast a little bit then add this little warp behind the portal. But even then, all that makes a difference. They could have just slapped the portal element on there and called it a day. I'm gonna pull back on the animation errors for now on, but this is the last major one I wanna point out. When his visor goes up, the bottom part of his mouth is colored in black. So much going on in this city. This is a really good future design. It looks like a combination of human cultures, alien cultures, fashion has evolved. Omnitrix City, that's what this place is called. I'm pretty sure a pop-up once said, what was his name, Edwin? From They Lurk Below, the rich kid's son, he helps Ben build Omnitrix City. Hey Ben, looking good. That's definitely Megan Smith. Yo, Ben 10K, keep up the awesome job! They even redrew the same background twice from two different angles. Look at this sign and this sign, and then you can see them here. Everything pretty much lines up. This building, this little hut right here. So they probably really did like plan out an actual map of the city or at least something for some consistency instead of just drawing random bullshit and making it look like the future. This is one of the most interesting locations in all four shows, and it's a shame we barely get to see any of it. In what? 
Our first hint at future Ben. Always love this statue. And it's great because the face is obscured because we don't see Ben 10,000's human form till the end of the episode. So it's just something that's hinted at, which is his turnaround, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Ben 10,000! Another thing that only makes sense if he actually went by Ben 10. <laughs> I forgot they blow it up. So that means in Ken 10, they rebuilt it. Hey, Tennyson. Long time no see. Hero of <laughs> That should have broke his face. <laughs> This force field has some good CG animation. When it disappears, it sort of warps away. That's really neat looking. The first screen time of Ben 10,000 is right here. Happens so fast you can barely see it. Is that Accelerate? Our first future alien. Only a slight physique change, mostly the shape of his visor. But I am digging this new outfit. Certainly took inspiration from it for its 5YL design. Looks like the work of Animo. He's doing a full-on x-ray of him. We can see inside of him. We got some bone structures in there and mechanics. I'm like four minutes into this episode and I can't stop looking at everything. It's like, God, it looks so cool. How can you not appreciate this? <laughs> and send them back now. That should be a solid hint that Ben is so used to time travel, he isn't even phased by this. It's not even like, whoa, you brought back my past self? It's like, come on, Gwendolyn, not today. Let's go do this crossover some other time. I don't have time for this. So Look at that, Ben is canonically faster than a future can accelerate. Hmm. How about never? Never. That was so malicious. Could lose, lose the attitude, attitude you know. You know. That's how she figures it out, not the literal same cat icon or the same color scheme or the same eyes. Gwen? Easily Gwen's best design in the whole franchise. Look, I didn't bring you here to find out about your future. So if you guys don't know, future Gwen is voiced by Tara Strong, who voices, for right now, present day Ben. So it's kind of cool that Tara got to play both Ben and Gwen in this episode. Just not, you know, the same ages. So time travel's no big deal now? You just need to know the right spell to create the right kind of portal. I know magic? How wicked is that? What else do I know how to do? Hey, did I ever get my black belt? Hello, forget you, this is about me! See, this episode leads you to believe that he turns into a jerk in the future. But I mean, I don't see Ben 10,000 acting like this. Like, this is kind of jerk behavior. If anything, we learn in the future he grows out of it. Ben 10 10,000 may have mastered the secrets of the Omnitrix. That one line just made the Omnitrix interesting all over again. There's a crisis looming even he can't solve alone. Oh, if you guys haven't seen it, the Watchtower database made like a big animated crisis crossover and they included a Ben 10 cameo. If they were ever going to redo it, they should include that clip because that's like a perfect lead in for like some type of crisis. You mean on infinite Earths? What's in Sector 15D? Earth's NASA genetic depository with DNA samples from across the galaxy. That sounds kind of ridiculous, but with the blending of human and alien cultures, maybe they need all of this so they can study their DNA so they can expand what Earth would need to take care of an alien population. Like they have to update their medical records, they have to update what they consider food. So yeah, having a whole DNA data bank, that could probably come in handy. Oh man, can't this thing power up faster in the future? It's not how time travel works, Ben. Yes, the rust bucket looks exactly the same. That's so great. Bearded Max. He's got them styling pants. But the same shirt. It was 20 years out of style 20 years ago. That's my second favorite line in the whole show. Hey, when you find a look that works. And that's my first. This subtle head nod is good animation because the pupils stay in the same position while the whole head rotates. Whoa, it's totally tagged out. You ain't seen nothing yet. Ah, oh, beautiful. So, where do I sleep? In your fancy headquarters, where else? You're too good to stay with us anymore. I mean, yeah, he's like saving the entire planet. I get they're pretty bummed about it, but they're making it sound like Ben just doesn't give a fuck about his family anymore. It's much more complicated than that. What is this architecture? This looks like a building was just crumbled together. Is this on purpose? If this is the place they trust to hold thousands of DNA deposits, I guess so. Crazy how they didn't make this rust bucket CG. They're really drawing it every frame. It's got some good consistency. Traditional vehicles on a TV budget is a hard thing to make look good, flying or not. You coming, Grandpa? You haven't needed my help for a long time. Oh, Grandpa. Show Ben 10,000 where it all begins. <laughs> With you messing up again. Ah, uh, the Omnitrix is drawn a bit funky right here. Let me just, uh, there we go. All better. Always love this little animation right here. Just looks cooler to see some movement in your backgrounds and establishing shots. Although this door goes from the same color as the walls to brown. Again, I could just spend hours looking at the backgrounds in this episode. 
subtle example of an evolution of skills past Gwen falls while future Gwen lands. And our second future alien, forearms. Like Accelerate, not too much of a difference, mostly just a costume thing. Some slight proportions in the neck and face. Hey, I was gonna go forearms too. 10,000 aliens and Ben still trying to use forearms all the time. Another great design, simple but effective. Like, this is all we really need. Just slap Animo's head on a gorilla body. For every one of your 10,000 heroes, I have still enough DNA to create 10,000 monstrous minions! Kind of similar to Kyber's plan with the Nematrix. So did Animo do it first because this episode came out first, or did Kyber do it first because chronologically he did it first? Marinate on that. Slap. Stay out of my way! Pretty effective, but let's hope this pipe wasn't connected to anything important, Ben. Also a very small detail, when Future Forearms is yelling at his past self, his saliva is green. It is better to let his future self handle this, though. With his past self, I can understand if his past self, which we come to know is pretty headstrong, if he gets killed, then Ben 10,000 gets wiped, right? Ben 10,000 doesn't trust that his past self wouldn't get himself killed, and let's be honest, you never really know with Ben. But yeah, you know, he should let Future Gwen help out. Charms are colored in a bit weirdly here. Spitter. Interesting he makes the choice to switch to Spitter, as if forearm strength wasn't enough to push him off of it. So maybe the force of Spitter's liquids shooting out of his mouth is stronger than the force of forearms pushing. Rapid changes, kind of reminiscent of the season 2 finale. This is the first time we really see Animo himself fight. Normally he sends his minions, but now he's upgraded his own body. I like the detail of the helmet going down to his spine. And this was pretty cool to see him become an alien we've seen before, but he hasn't transformed into before, showing how interconnected the Omnitrix is with the beings of the galaxy. Cannon Bolt. Wow. Eh, yeah, he did pretty much take care of all that himself. What do you call that latter one? They're not pets. I don't name them anymore. Oh, but that was half the fun. Ah, uh, that's so true. But yeah, after 10,000 aliens, I can get that he might be kind of sick of coming up with names for them. I've barely even come up with like a hundred of my own aliens, and I'm already sick of coming up with names. Speaking of aliens, I've drawn over 200 transformations during my tenure on my Drawing with Kuro streams. Redesigning the canon ones, making up a few of my own, and even redrawing a ton of fan-submitted transformations. Before I take my break, I'm closing off with a special stream this coming Saturday, April 3rd, where I will be combining every single transformation I've drawn into one large poster and raffling one off at the end. If you're watching this breakdown the day it comes out, make sure you tune in tomorrow so you don't miss it. But in the future, the stream will remain on the channel for you guys to come back and enjoy. Now, back to the breakdown. <laughs> Man, Ben really doesn't give a fuck about the piping. Ah, uh, cool to see them again. It's a big world, Ben. You could always save a couple of the bad guys for us, you know. Eh, he's right, but he's making it sound like this is all just a big game. Also, is future Ultimos buffer than his original self? Yeah, just a little bit, but this could just be whoever was animating him. Because they were drawing forearms a lot, so maybe they're just used to drawing that body shape. But he looks jacked compared to how we saw him in Galactic Enforcers. <laughs> Pretty neat that when he transforms back, his tail turns into his foot. Makes you wonder how the cognitive relations between how he operates his physical form and between transforming into different aliens. Like, we move our hands and fingers around like it's no big deal, but imagine if we had like four of them? What is the mental process we have to think to operate that many limbs? Or wings? What would it feel like to try to make your wings flap? Would it feel like how like we're going like this or something? I don't know, being an alien's weird. Oh, this is interesting. They're animating the bottom of his helmet as if it was his mouth. Headquarters. So Ultimos' cape clips over Tiny once Gwendolyn flies by, but then goes back behind her after a few frames. Yes, you got me now! There's nothing I can do! <laughs> Vilgax. Rather lucky he landed on Vilgax's pod. Animo's been around this whole time? And say what you want about Animo, but he's one of the people that gives Ben one of the hardest times. What about Vilgax? Last I saw of him, I left him in pieces. It wasn't pretty for anyone. Kinda like how the end of Goodbye and Good Riddance lines up. A lot of people think this shares the same timeline as that episode. Oh, I really need to lighten up. I mean, we've seen the timeline where Ben doesn't try to kill Vilgax, that's Alien Force. And eventually, one time Vilgax will delete the whole multiverse, so, you know, kill him while you can. It's not super noticeable, but Tiny and some Naptak don't say a single word this whole episode, because you can only have so many voice actors per episode. Man, he should have done that against Ben. Yeah, he definitely looks like he was burned alive in the sewers. You can even see his skull. So nice you could rejoin me. 
and now we see Mount Rushmore again. And I like that because we saw Mount Rushmore in the beginning to show that all they did was time travel. They're still in the exact same spot this whole episode. Not to keep shoving in so much 5YL info, but in the story I have where Ben is 21 and he's officially employed by the plumbers since around the world and pretty much around the entire galaxy, people have no problem treating him with some kindness and giving him food and stuff. All of his actual plumber salary he's saving up so that he can fund the development of Omnitrix City. So he pretty much gives up his entire plumber paychecks in order for this city to be built, which I personally think he would realistically do in the show too. Like how else is he gonna get this place made? <laughs> This is my headquarters? I must chill out here a lot. Accelerate just kind of runs over this background like it's a flat ground. There's no time. I'm always patrolling the planet. So he's basically grown up to be like a superhero workaholic. Don't I have any fun anymore? You will learn soon enough. Being me is not about fun. See, it's trying to paint the picture that Ben grows up to be a jerk, but I mean, he's not wrong. There's many scenarios where if Ben wasn't around during his road trip so far, things would have gone horribly wrong. Like, most of the times he stops his bad guys is by coincidence. So if he's able to go around the entire world and try to protect it, it's not like he doesn't want to have fun, but he probably just realizes there's quite literally no time for it if you're trying to constantly save everyone. And he has another good point about how being him isn't all about having fun. And that's something that present-day Ben really needs to understand. So as much as I see that Ben growing up to disassociate himself with his family, yeah, that's kind of an issue. But it's not like he just grows up to be an asshole. He's just taking his work incredibly seriously. But it does suck that he doesn't see Gwen and Max often anymore. And don't touch a thing. Come on, Ben, you know yourself. You're absolutely gonna touch anything the first chance you get. Hey, look, he said not to touch anything. Why should I listen to me? You never do. So many good one-liners in this episode. Stop that board now. What? I don't even smile when I terrorize Gwen anymore? <laughs> You're even worse than I thought. See, like, why is that a bad thing? Oh, wow, you don't get any enjoyment out of pissing off your cousin? Good, that's something that you need to grow out of. Like, future Ben definitely needs to make stronger efforts to keep his family closer together, but he doesn't need to do a complete 180. I mean, a lot of his future developments are good character traits. Cool move, huh? Wanna race? Those days are over. I am such a jerk! Not really. Well, I'm not going. You brought me here for a reason. And I bet it's what's going on in Sector 1 Eccentric. Is it far away? Yeah, see, I can see that attitude evolving into the version of Ben we see in the future. So it's a realistic character progression for the route that Ben's on right now. <gasps> the Null Void Projector. <laughs> Surprised if you could touch anything with those gorilla fingers. This might be just a lighting thing, but his visor is green here. I actually kind of dig it this way, though. Oh, but it's only just beginning. Animo is like, all right, Vilgax, I'll bring you back to life on one condition. You make sure you get that dramatic intro right, you hear? I'm talking sit in the shadows until it's your time. This Vilgax is massive. Look at him compared to the Null Void Chamber. <laughs> he took the hoverboard. Vilgax, he's mine. Take Animo. <laughs> Oh, scary. Yeah, like the hoverboard would have done anything. This is your fight, it's my fight too. Well then, this might help. Ah, oh, sweet. Really makes that earlier line pay off where she talks about Ben mastering the secrets of the Omnitrix. This is probably one of the best future designs. Really looks like an evolution of the species. <laughs> Look at this massive leap that Gwen does. As if she really needed that keystone of Bazel. Nice, we've seen some of Hex's spells have both this ripple and a fire effect. So it's adding that extra interconnectivity of Gwendolyn being destined to be a master sorceress. This was a great move that Vilgax does. Get in there. Another favorite future form. The shoulder volcanoes really make a difference. Then boom, back into Stinkfly. Kevin does that too in Framed. Get your claws off my grandson. Excellent call back to Secrets. He's even got the same device. Claws off my grandson, Vilgax. Help the Gwens. They're by the Null Void. Even past Ben's like, we don't need you, Grandpa. <laughs> God, Gwen is insane. Like, come on, her being half alien isn't that ridiculous. She's 10 years old, confidently fighting a massive gorilla. And she's like, bring it. Nina, go! So she goes from firing a laser beam in this shot to a trail of fire in this one. And Gwen's running in the shinobi way. See, look at that. She kicks him and it knocks him off balance. He is a massive gorilla. Jeepers creepers, Gwen. 
and this doesn't kill her. Also, this is interesting. I pictured this as a full body suit, but apparently it's two separate articles of clothing. Then again, if it was full body, it would be really hard to get on and off, unless you're magic. <laughs> 17 minutes in and this episode still pulling surprises. A lot can happen in 20 years. Come on. So if you notice, even though he has this arm, he still uses the same Mount Rushmore device to shoot Vilgax, really linking together that that weapon is one of Vilgax's weaknesses. If only it had a name. Let's show him what we Tennysons are made of. Yeah. He may know how all your aliens fight. But does he know what Ben Tennyson can do? Pretty famous error, but he's got the 10,000 detailing on his hands. I feel like I'm pointing out too many errors in this episode, but lately in the breakdowns, I've been trying to cut down on them. But now suddenly the comments are filled with them. So I'm just mentioning them so that you guys know I see them. And they're cool to find. It's like an Easter egg hunt. And now we finally see future Ben. Maybe it's time I did start fighting like you. I'm so glad they waited till this moment to show his human form. Quite literally, being human is what makes Ben who he is. So once he starts losing his humanity, he starts losing interest in his human form. Pretty nice subtle metaphor there. Good job, Greg Wiseman. Even he can't help but think that was cool. I wonder how he's able to choose the aliens. Like, that's a whole, that's a whole topic. Follow my lead. Now, it's not to say that none of his aliens can do what he's doing here, but it's the freedom and the mindset he has in his human form that allows him to get the advantage. Further emphasizing that it really is being Ben that makes him special and capable, and not the Omnitrix. Anyone can put on the watch, but Ben's the one that knows how to make it work. <laughs> And we get to see more of the city in this. Although here's an error you guys probably haven't noticed. The same background that Ben uses to flip into Spitter here is the exact same one you see when they're falling earlier. Now reusing backgrounds is fine, but the reason it's an error is because we see during this chase scene, Ben is bringing Vilgax to a different location. Yet here they're back again. All right, we, got, we all set with the errors now? Cool. Fan favorite Spitter. So is that an energy enhancing spell? It's interesting that her eyes glow blue even though her magic is yellow now. Power fist. Yeah, even grandpa's getting some hits in. Happy birthday, Grandpa! Subtle change, but when Ben embraces being lighthearted again, his hair starts to look similar to his 10-year-old self compared to being combed back earlier. Sorry, Ben. Take your alert. Can't you guys see it's my Grandpa's birthday? You handle it. Of course! That's a sweet moment. I know your Ben can be a major dweeb, but enjoy him while you can. It's like she's talking to the fans right there. You never told me the secrets of the watch! How I don't have to go Ben! You're gonna wanna go Ben. Take this. Oh, uh, how could you not like this episode? Something I should have gotten Grandpa 20 years ago. See ya! And I guess we're gonna be ya! Ah, uh, even the cheesy lines are good. We got you a cake. Happy birthday. Everything comes full circle in this episode. Take a wish, Grandpa! So that's undoubtedly another super impactful episode on the fandom. We didn't realize it at the time, but this was our first window into the big time traveling multiversal multiple Ben stories that become so commonplace by Omniverse that the fourth show is even named after it. But back then when this happened, it was a huge deal. I feel like everyone's major takeaway from this episode is the future aliens. Like this episode is jam packed with so much stuff, but beyond the future aliens, I don't hear people really talking about this episode, which is kind of unfortunate because there's really a lot to unpack here. So let's start by giving the plot a five. The reason being is how everything seems to connect in this episode. Everything they introduce gets some type of satisfying conclusion one way or another. And it's not just vaguely and subtly nodding to changes in the future. Like in Ultimate Alien, when we meet the second Ben 10,000, he's like, oh, Gwen's president in the future. But aside from being an offhand comment, it doesn't mean anything and it doesn't have a resolution. I like how this episode begins and ends with the theme of Max's birthday. Also, Animo's convoluted plan to revive Vilgax and upgrade him to be able to counter every single single one of Ben's aliens so that he's free enough to steal DNA from the Null Void. And the time travel plot about Gwendolyn trying to get Ben to embrace his more sympathetic and youthful characteristics is a refreshing and solid reason for using the time travel trope instead of being something as simple as just a threat that needs multiple Bens to defeat. Not that that isn't cool, I love that stuff. And this episode does have that, but above everything else, this episode is about how the Tennyson family grows apart in the future, and perhaps seeing how things used to be is what they needed to bring that back into their lives. Plus, you know, future Vilgax and future Animo teaming up was just plain cool. Omnitrix City was awesome. Even the small moments we got with the Galactic Enforcers came full circle. How it's more about how Ben needs to start letting go of the idea that he's responsible for the whole world, and accept the help that's given to him, not just for the benefit of fighting crime, but allow Ben to start living his life again. Which is where we get into characterization. And this is pretty much
much where the title of the video comes from. Because even up until right before this breakdown, I just bought the idea that future Ben is a jerk because this episode is written to make you think that and nothing else gets talked about in this episode in the fandom aside from the future aliens. But when looking for the characterization traits, not only is it fully believable that Ben will grow up to be this version of Ben 10,000, but I also think he's misunderstood. He's dropped the pranks, he's dropped the ego, he's dropped the impulsive behavior. He really did become the best version of himself in order to be the hero of heroes. But on that journey, a lot of his humanity and his relationships got lost in the process. When he's talking to young Ben in the headquarters, he's never like, oh, I hate fun. It's, I never have time for fun. Or it's not like, oh, I don't want to see Gwen and Grandpa. It's, I never have time to see Gwen and Grandpa. It's like I said during the actual breakdown, pretty much everything he stopped in the summer so far was because he just came across it. Imagine if you had the ability to patrol the entire world. Would you not feel like you would want to save everybody as much as you can. This is jumping ahead a little bit, but it's kind of like how the fans see Alien X with Ben. Like if Ben has Alien X, why doesn't he stop all the wars in the world, revive all the planets that were wiped out by the big tick, cure disease? And while Ben eventually grows into someone who doesn't see that type of power being worthy of a singular responsibility, right now we kind of see what Ben would be like if he did believe those viewpoints, where if you have the power to do anything, you should. So Ben having the Omnitrix and 10,000 aliens and the capability to save the whole world, he feels like he needs to. Because who else is gonna do it better than him? Who else is gonna take it as seriously? And you know, people who aren't him, it's hard not to take that personally. Because as much as Gwendolyn and Grandpa Max accept that Ben is doing what he believes to be right, because if you notice, they're not mad at him. They're not against Ben. It's more of like the younger Gwen and Ben that call him a jerk, but they still do feel like they're left to the side. Because Ben could be making more time for them, but he doesn't. All I'm saying is Ben 10,000 is not a jerk. I think from literally one, maybe two snarky comments, which weren't even that offensive, he didn't really do anything wrong. Yes, he absolutely needed a major attitude adjustment that younger Ben was able to give him. And now realizing this, he absolutely needs to stay on that and keep efforts to create a stronger family. But the mood and themes of this episode paint a different picture than the Ben 10,000 we're really seeing. But because of the events of this episode creating such a complex viewpoint of how being Ben 10,000 affects himself and the people around him, I think it's pretty obvious this episode deserves a five in characterization. It really really explores the hardships of being the hero of heroes in a non-world-ending way. And visuals, it has to get a solid five. I know there's many an animation error that I did point out in these breakdowns, but I guarantee you not a single one would really stand out to you on your first, maybe even second time watching. There's crazy backgrounds and fast-paced action and some pretty solid animation. I mean, the rust bucket freaking flies for crying out loud. Like this episode, it, it's getting a five. This rating segment has also run super long, but I feel like in my early earlier points, I've explained why I'm also going to give this a five in every other category too. I'm really not trying to overhype this episode. Like it's, it's just, it's solid. It's good. It's got great writing. It's got great characters. It's got great action. And it builds an entire world in 22 minutes. It's truly one of the best episodes of Ben 10 of all time, which is why it definitely deserves that 25 out of 25. For this week's roadmap segment, we have a first. Now we've seen the Tennysons return to a few states a hand full of times before, but this is the first time they've returned to an exact location they've already been to, which is Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore has now appeared in every season so far, as the last time they were here, they stayed from the end of season 1 until the beginning of season 2. Where will the Tennysons take their summer vacation next? Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. With only one breakdown in this video, there isn't much need for a final thought segment. So instead, I'll just be announcing this week's poll. Do you think Ben 10,000 was actually a jerk, or do you agree with me that he was just misunderstood? I'll admit, this video was to try to persuade you to my side, but please be honest when voting. I mean, I'm not always right, I'm just some guy. Make sure to look out for that poll in our community tab, but until then, you can stay up to date with everything that we do on our social medias and join the Discord for some fun community interaction. You can also join our Patreon for $1 a month for exclusive weekly updates on our projects such as Five Years Later and and beyond. I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend and until next time, keep it fizzy.